So at this stage, I'm going to hand over to um, Neil. So Neil, over to you, and I'll, I'll drive the slides. So just tell me when you'd like to advance. All right. Yep. Hey, thank you, Simon. And it's a pleasure to be here at Virtual iWackle. Uh, as Simon just said, I'm Neil Trevitt. I work on developer ecosystems at NVIDIA. Uh, I'm president of the Kronos Group and also chair of the OpenCL um, working group. So I'm going to briefly update you on the OpenCL 3.0 launch. Uh, this is going to be a lightning tour, uh, but there are many more details on the Kronos website now if you're interested. So next slide, Simon. So let's start by reminding ourselves why you know, this launch matters to the industry. Uh, OpenCL is the most widely used open standard for low-level pr parallel programming. And this is at a time when Moore's law is slowing, and so parallel programming and acceleration offload to heterogeneous processors is becoming ever more interesting and essential. Uh, in markets, everything from high-performance computing through desktop down to embedded and mobile platforms. Uh, OpenCL is widely deployed by GPU vendors and an ever increasing number of applications, engines and libraries use it. And it's acting as a backend target for languages, compilers, machine learning stacks uh, that need a portable API to reach down into hardware acceleration. And that includes, of course, uh, Kronos' own Sickle. Next slide. So just like Simon has his uh, tradition, uh, it's, it's become my iWackle tradition to plot the growth in number of open source projects using OpenCL each year. And I'm glad to see that the, this year the curve is accelerating. We've now broken through the 9,000 project barrier. So that's actually a doubling in just under three years. And of course, one of the most topical and significant open source projects right now is Folding at Home, uh, being used to research the coronavirus, amongst other things. Uh, Folding at Home, you might know, uses OpenCL for the GPU acceleration in its network of consumer PCs. And it's now delivering an amazing 2.4 exaflops. Uh, that's faster than the top 500 traditional supercomputers in the world combined. And it's all largely thanks to OpenCL. So next slide. So OpenCL is going to save the world, we hope. So um, let's talk about OpenCL 3.0. It was launched yesterday here at iWackle. This is a pretty unique launch because it doesn't add lots of new functionality to the API. It's really an ecosystem realignment. And the intent is to enable OpenCL to thrive and move forward and reach even more developers and devices. So to understand 3.0, we have to look back at OpenCL's evolution, uh, much of which has unfolded each year here at the annual iWACL conference. Um, so this slide is a kind of a historical summary. It includes the missteps as well as the successes, because that is where, of course, where we learn the most valuable lessons. So I'm going to walk you through this slide. On, on the left, we see how significantly OpenCL has influenced the Kronos ecosystem by spawning Spear, which evolved into Spear V, which became a foundational building block for Vulkan. Also, Sickle started as a layer over OpenCL, but now Sickle is significantly impacting the industry and being made available over multiple API backends. But looking at OpenCL's evolution, uh, in hindsight, I think it was remarkable how quickly the combination of OpenCL 1.2 and OpenCLC became a widely adopted baseline that successfully addressed the needs of a wide number of developers and platforms. Then OpenCL 2.x, added significant new functionality. Uh, but a series of monolithic specifications became increasingly onerous for vendors to implement when much of that functionality was not applicable to their own customers. And so the adoption rate over time for 2.x uh, decreased. So this leads directly to the most important aspect of 3.0. In a precise and carefully designed way, OpenCL 3.0 makes all the 2.x functionality beyond 1.2 optional. This enables vendors to focus on shipping the functionality they need for their customers. And also, somewhat paradoxically, resets the opportunity to carefully raise the bar on core functionality that can become as pervasive as OpenCL 1.2. The philosophy behind OpenCL3 also sets the stage for extended optionality and possible future flexible profile to enable diverse embedded processors to deploy open, the OpenCL 
runtime framework pervasively and cost effectively in those new markets. OpenCL 3.0 also embraces cooperation with the open source LLVM Clang community to build effective kernel language solutions. OpenCL 3 does not include the OpenCL C++ specification. OpenCL 3.0 implementations are encouraged to use the C++ for OpenCL open source front-end compiler that enables full OpenCL C to be mixed with much of C++ 17 to generate Spear V kernels. Lastly, we want to put to, put to rest one blind alley that was discussed at previous IWOCLs, the idea that we would somehow merge OpenCL and Vulkan. We now know that both APIs are gonna be successful in their own right. Vulkan focused on GPU acceleration and mixed compute and rendering. OpenCL will probably continue to have more evolved compute capabilities and can be significantly easier to implement and to program. Next slide, Simon. So what is OpenCL3? OpenCL3 ships a new unified API specification, carefully designed queryable optionality for all the OpenCL2.x uh, functionality. In addition, the announcement yesterday does include a significant extension for DSP-like processors to asynchronously and flexibly transfer 2D and 3D data between global and local memories via DMA transactions. And we believe this is gonna be the first in a series of upcoming advances in OpenCL to enhance support for embedded processors. The OpenCL 3.0 specification is provisional, so we can get developer feedback before we finalize. But once we do, we expect OpenCL 3.0 to gain rapid industry adoption. Current applications are fully compatible with any 3.0 device that supports the functionality they use. And we do recommend re developers over time to use the 2.x level functionality queries for future cross-vendor portability. Implementers simply need to add the new queries for all 2.x functionality, whether that functionality is missing or present to their existing implementations. Next slide. So looking forward uh, into the roadmap, OpenCL will ship new functionality first as extensions and only when they are fully implemented and then ensuring they are proven and widely adopted before we consider folding them into future core specifications. There are quite a few extensions in the drafting pipeline, including things like extended subgroups, Vulcan interop, and accelerated machine learning primitives. As well as defining specifications, the OpenCL Working Group is working hard to build out a Kronos OpenCL SDK and to encourage an ever stronger ecosystem of domain specific libraries. As well as considering that flexible profile for embedded processors, the OpenCL Working Group is also discussing whether we need a profile to precisely specify layered OpenCL implementations, and more on that in just a second. But it, at the general level, we do see profiles as a vital tool to harness OpenCL's flexibility. We hope it's going to enable us to strike the appropriate balance between implementation flexibility but also application portability and, and not too much fragmentation for each of our target markets. Next slide. So let's talk about this growing industry trend of layering APIs over other APIs. It's a trend that's been building for a while. In particular, the cross compilation of shading languages by an increasingly robust open source compiler ecosystem. For developers, a layered API can enable their application on platforms that don't support that API natively. Good examples include the Molten VK Vulkan implementation over Metal and the Google CLSPV compiler layering OpenCL over Vulkan, which is being used to bring demanding OpenCL applications, such as Adobe's video editing apps, onto Android. CLSPV is also a great example of layered APIs also being invaluable to platform vendors that can enable content on their platform without incurring the support load of additional kernel level drivers. Uh, 
A good example of this is the newly announced OpenCL on 12 open source project by Microsoft that will enable GPU accelerated OpenCL applications on any system with DX12. Next slide. Kronos' Spear V is at the center, I think, of this growing ecosystem of open source kernel language compilers, which includes Clang and LLVM that can generate Spear V kernels, either for direct ingestion by OpenCL or Vulkan, or for further translation into shaders to run on other APIs such as Metal, which would enable OpenCL applications on Apple platforms without needing to use OpenCL drivers. Also, Open, Microsoft's OpenCL on 12 project translates the LLVM generated Spear V kernels using a Mesa open source conversion pipeline to DXIL, which is the DirectX intermediate language for execution on DX12. Enabling language compilers to innovate independently from runtimes was always kind of the primary dream behind Spear V, and it's really great to see you know, this vision come to fruition. So last slide, Simon, one more. So that's uh, OpenCL3 in a nutshell in 10 minutes. Um, as we mentioned, the spec is provisional. We warmly request your feedback to help us finalize the spec. Uh, while we also complete the conformance test suite and we prepare the first wave of implementations over the next few months. The working group has placed the source of the specifications and the source of the conformance tests in open source on our GitHub to enable and accelerate that feedback process. So thank you for your time. Again, all these slides and more are on the Kronos website. And we have many folks here on the panel that have been instrumental in creating OpenCL3. And so we look forward to answering your questions later. Thank you. That's, that's brilliant. Thank you, Neil.